Welcome to the Answers for Elders radio show. Meet the trusted experts who will give you straight answers and will help guide you on the path of later life care. Now, here's your host, founder, caregiver, and CEO, Suzanne Newman. And welcome back, everyone, to Answers for Elders radio network. And we're talking about Alzheimer's disease in this segment of number three of five. And we're going to be talking a little bit about testing with Dr. Paul Winner. And he is the senior director of the Premier Research Institute and the director of the Memory Disorder Center in West Palm Beach, Florida. And Dr. Winner, we've been talking so many things about you know, how it comes on and it's early. I'm learning so much. I can't even believe it. And I, here I thought I knew a lot about Alzheimer's disease. So thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for so, the invitation. So I have a um, question for you. And before we get into this topic, um, obviously we do a lot of support with family caregivers. Um, you know, mom may be fine, but they, you start seeing dad have a little bit of tracking, you know, issues. How, uh, you know, obviously we want to get people tested as soon as possible. And I can only imagine there's someone back there in, you know, out there in our listenership going, you know, how in the world do I even approach this subject with dad? What do I need to do to, you know, to get everybody on the same page? And, you know, obviously everyone's an individual, but um, there's, there's some promise and some hope that I'm really hearing in what you have to say. And so I'd love to have you address kind of a broad brush. I don't mean for you to get into details, but how do people, I guess, start the process? Well, I think you, you want to let people know that we have very good diagnostic methods today. We mm -hmm. can actually determine what it is. It could be something simple. Mm -hmm. So you need to go to a center, uh, essentially a memory disorder center. If you really have a problem as you're discussing, the person has a memory disorder issue. There is something already present. It's essentially now affecting the family. Mm -hmm. That's no longer, I'm worried if I have a little bit of an issue with my memory. This sure. is affecting the family. That, that you have to go to a memory disorder center. Most general doctors don't have, they're not up to speed yet. They're starting to. We, in fact, I gave a lecture last night to essentially address this to primary care physicians in our area of what is about to take place. Mm -hmm. So we all have to get better testing in the area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They need to get to a place that can do one, a very, very good history and a very good physical exam. And they're looking at domains of how the brain works. A good history can determine how long it's been that there's been memory issues. What was the initial problem? Mm -hmm. Was it a short-term memory issue? Was it an immediate memory issue? Was it a behavior issue? Was it a movement problem? What is it? Because there's all different kinds of dementias. True. Or maybe it's something else. A medication got changed a year ago, and that's when this all started. Mm -hmm. So there are some simpler problems. There's thyroid conditions in the family, and their medicine got changed. There's a lot of different variables. So a mm -hmm. very good history, a very good physical exam. You need to do laboratory studies, basic laboratory studies, to make sure there is not a problem with thyroid. There isn't a B12 deficiency. Mm -hmm. There isn't an autoimmune or infectious process. This is not expensive and not hard to do. The next is a neurobehavioral. You need proper testing on what is going on with the brain. What is the aspect that's wrong? Is it memory? Is it executive function? Is it processing speed? All the different aspects, attention problems, multiple areas that are non-functional, one area, two areas. This gives you a clue right away of what you're dealing with. It also something, let's say the MMSE, mini mental status examination or the MOCA, right away we get a number that's generated and we know whether we're dealing with something in a very early stage, such as maybe mild cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. or we're dealing with a slight earlier Alzheimer's or an earlier dementia or moderate dementia. That guides us as well. Mm -hmm. The next phase is you need a picture of the brain. You need to make sure there's not another explanation. So True. you have to look, or maybe they have a mix. You, We've talked about this a little before, is there could be two dementias. The Alzheimer's type, where you have atrophy in the temporal lobe, a specific lobe of the brain, a little parietal, 
or you have problems with white matter changes where essentially you have vascular dementia. And that's a mild, moderate, severe, we grade that. So we're able to put that together. Sometimes it's a glioblastoma. It's a brain tumor that's caused this. Sometimes it's a meningioma with edema, and that's really easy. We can treat that. That's a treatable problem. And they're all better pretty quickly. Sometimes the lab studies, they're better. Then let's say we go through that, and it's suggestive that we're dealing with clinically Alzheimer's dementia. Well, that is the clinical aspect, and you can make a clinical diagnosis. But you're not going to be right a lot of the times. You need to go to the next level. The next level is biomarkers. And there are several now. We have serum biomarkers, but the goal, the, essentially the gold study, the, the most important study we should do uh, is to use a PET scan, an amyloid PET scan, and or add to that a tau PET scan. There's two proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's. That's amyloid and tau. So we can tell whether they're present, but amyloid is the simpler one, the more basic one. If you do not have amyloid deposited in the brain of a significance, you do not have Alzheimer's disease, period. It's something else. Interesting. But it's not Alzheimer's. So, but that test is expensive. It's five, wow. six, seven thousand, and it's not covered by insurance right now. Oh my goodness. This, this is why the biomarkers, the serum biomarkers, which we use in research all the time now, are going to be very, very important as they start to be used by primary care doctors and others. They'll be able to use the behavioral tests the biomarkers, because they can be very efficient as well. Mm -hmm. They're not available that much. They're kind of expensive. And we have something called phosphorylated tau, and we have three of them, 181, mm -hmm. 217, 231. Right now, this seems all foreign, but in a few years, this will be very common to everyone. Mm -hmm. We don't know which is the best and the cheapest just right now. Mm -hmm. Probably going to be 217 or 231. So primary care doctors, initial assessments, part of your eval, as people, you know, right. get a little older. Right. Why is it so important to do this? We need to know the diagnosis. We must get it correct because right. certain medicines we're developing are de being developed for Alzheimer's. Others are being developed for general dementias, others for Parkinson's. Others may work in all of these different dementias. We need to know what the person has so we can select the right medicine as we move forward. And mm -hmm. there's going to be way more than one medicine. There is not going to be a single solution, not right away. Mm -hmm. Future genetic modifications, maybe. Mm -hmm. But right now, in the near future, like next year, um, we're going to have medicines that we That's will be amazing. able to select. But you don't yeah. give someone a monoclonal antibody to remove amyloid if they don't have amyloid in the brain. That's true. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, yeah. We have to get the diagnosis correct. We have to know what they call the biomarkers. And it's a neurobiological disease. So there's right. the neuroclinical disease. Mm -hmm. One way, our diagnostic issues. And the neurobiological disease, our biomarkers, of which the PET scan yeah. is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I... I go back to my caregiving years with my mom who had vascular dementia. Um, you know, there was still things like you said, there, there's still things that she was still the mother. I was still the daughter. I did not have any authority with her. Right. But one thing I did learn in this process, and I think it's important to bring this up because there's a lot of families out there listening. I learned to write a note to the doctor put a little put it in a little white envelope when we checked in so and so that they her doctor knew exactly what was going on so i didn't have to say things in front of her but the doctor got a little bit more idea of what was happening um and that was kind of my little my little help and i didn't have to bring up things that might cause her embarrassment in her head um you know, and I think that's one of the things that I want to talk about is that families really, you become this amazing team member, you know, they, they can be amazing team member and certainly study partners, but they can also not be. I, what I'm trying to say is, is that they may say, oh, dad's fine. It's no big deal or anything like that. But getting those tests are so vitally important, but obviously understanding what's really happening in their everyday life, that has to be equally important, is it not? A absolutely. You, you bring some very important points, and that's the caregiver. Some caregivers find it very easy to handle the situation, especially mm -hmm. 
there are different ways that people mature through this illness. And some people don't experience the paranoias. They don't experience the behavioral issues there. Yeah. Again, there are different types of dementias with that. So they have an easier course of it. But either way, no matter what, easier or more difficult, the caregiver suffers. It's yeah. a lot of stress on the caregiver. They're watching their loved one. They're watching someone they really care about mm -hmm. literally disappear in front of their eyes. They just mm -hmm. kind of gray out. Our hope is that we will be able to really significantly slow that process mm -hmm. very soon. But the caregivers need support too. I mentioned the Alzheimer's Association has support for caregivers they and do. there's local support as well. We try to do that with our own office. Um, we basically let them know that what's about to happen. So you try to get mm -hmm. in front of it a little bit. The most important thing is early diagnosis and I do believe we will have options very soon mm -hmm. to not let this happen in the first place. Right. We're moving very, very slowly right this minute, but it's about to take off, I believe, as the clinician who's been doing the research, yeah. so that we'll have a significant plate to choose from, a menu, so to speak, to choose from of medications, depending on where the person is, what the situation is, to slow this disease down. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll have time to talk about that. In the we future. absolutely will, because that's one of my most important, uh, you know, mantras is that I know that there's hope. This is this is all about hope. And if you, you know, there's so many people, um, you know, especially here in the Pacific Northwest where we are, we have a very high degree of population with those that suffer from Alzheimer's disease in the state of Washington. And I don't necessarily know why that is. Uh, maybe but because they've proven it's not the rain or the gloom or anything like that it's just it, i don't know if it's the air or whatever we do here but um the idea is obviously is that there is hope there are options and so uh, dr winner how do we reach you uh easiest way is just to give me a call area code 561-851-9400 that's 561-851 Nine four hundred or Premier Research Institute, P R E M I E R E Research Institute dot com. Fabulous, and Dr. Winner and I are going to be talking about treatment opportunities in our next segment. Coming up next. We at Answers for Elders thank you for listening. Did you know that you can discover hundreds of podcasts in our library on senior care? So visit our website and discover our decision guides that will help you also navigate decision-making. Find us at AnswersForElders.com.